This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World in 72 Days by Nellie Bly. Chapter 15 120 Hours in Japan. After seeing Hong Kong with its wharfs crowded with dirty boats manned by still dirtier people, and its streets packed with a filthy crowd, Yokohama has a cleaned-up Sunday appearance. Travelers are taken from the ships, which anchor some distance out in the bay, to the land in small steam launches. The first-class hotels in the different ports have their individual launches, but like American hotel omnibuses, while being run by the hotel to assist in procuring patrons, the traveler pays for them just the same. An import as well as an export duty is charged in Japan, but we pass the custom inspectors unmolested. I found the Japanese jinriksha men a gratifying improvement upon those I had seen from Ceylon to China. They presented no sight of filthy rags, nor naked bodies, nor smell of grease. Clad in neat navy blue garments, their little pudgy legs encased in unwrinkled tights, the upper half of their bodies in short jackets with wide flowing sleeves, their clean, good-natured faces peeping from beneath comical mushroom-shaped hats, their blue-black wiry locks cropped just above the nape of the neck, they offered a striking contrast to the jinriksha men of other countries. Their crests were embroidered upon the back and sleeves of their top garment, as are the crests of every man, woman, and child in Japan. Raid the night previous had left the streets muddy and the air cool and crisp, but the sun creeping through the mistiness of early morning fell upon us with most gratifying warmth. Wrapping our knees with rugs, the rickshaw men started off in a lively trot to the Pacific Mail and O and O Company's office, where I met discourteous people for the first time since I left the P and O Victoria, and these were Americans too. The most generous excuse that can be offered for them is that they have held their position so long that they feel they are masters, instead of a steamship company's servants. A man going into the office to buy a ticket to America was answered in the following manner by one of the head men. You'll have to come back later if you want a ticket. I'm going to lunch now. I stayed at the Grand Hotel while in Japan. It is a large building with long verandas, wide halls and airy rooms commanding an exquisite view of the lake in front. Barring an enormous and monotonous collection of rats, the Grand would be considered a good hotel even in America. The food is splendid and the service excellent. The Japs, noiseless, swift, anxious to please, stand at the head of all the servants I encountered from New York to New York, and then they look so neat in their blue tights and white linen jackets. I always have an inclination to laugh when I look at the Japanese men in their native dress. Their legs are small and their trousers are skin tight. The upper garment, with its great wide sleeves, is as loose as the lower is tight. When they finish their get-up by placing their dishpan-shaped hat upon their heads, the wonder grows how such small legs can carry it all. Stick two straws in one end of a potato, a mushroom in the other, set it up on straws and you have a Japanese in outline talk about French heels. The Japanese sandal is a small board elevated on two pieces of thin wood fully five inches in height. They make the people look exactly as if they were on stilts. These queer shoes are fastened to the foot by a single strap running between toes number one and two, the wearer when walking necessarily maintaining a sliding instead of an up and down movement in order to keep the shoe on. On a cold day, one would imagine the Japanese were a nation of armless people. They fold their arms up in their long, loose sleeves. A Japanese woman's sleeves are to her what a boy's pockets are to him. Her cards, money, combs, hairpins, ornaments, and rice paper are carried in her sleeves. Her rice paper is her handkerchief, and she notes with horror and disgust that after using we return our handkerchiefs to our pockets. I think the Japanese women carry everything in their sleeves, even their hearts. Not that they are fickle. None are more true, more devoted, more loyal, more constant than Japanese women. But they are so guileless and artless that almost any one, if opportunity offers, can pick at their trusting hearts. 
If I loved and married, I would say to my mate, Come, I know where Eden is, and like Edwin Arnold, desert the land of my birth for Japan, the land of love, beauty, poetry, cleanliness. I somehow always connected Japan and its people with China and its people, believing the one no improvement on the other. I could not have made a greater mistake. Japan is beautiful. Its women are charmingly sweet. I know little about the men except that they do not go far as we judge manly beauty, being undersized, dark, and far from prepossessing. They have the reputation of being extremely clever, so I do not speak of them as a whole, only of those I came in contact with. I saw one a giant in frame, a god in features, but he was a public wrestler. The Japanese are the direct opposite to the Chinese. The Japanese are the cleanliest people on earth. The Chinese are the filthiest. The Japanese are always happy and cheerful. The Chinese are always grumpy and morose. The Japanese are the most graceful of people. The Chinese the most awkward. The Japanese have few vices. The Chinese have all the vices in the world. In short, the Japanese are the most delightful of people. The Chinese the most disagreeable. The majority of the Europeans live on the bluff in low white bungalows, with great rooms and breezy verandas, built in the hearts of oriental gardens, where one can have an unsurpassed view of the Mississippi Bay, or can play tennis or cricket or loll in hammocks, guarded from public gaze by luxurious green hedges. The Japanese homes form a great contrast to the bungalows. They are daintily small, like playhouses indeed, built of a thin, shingle-like board, fine in texture. Chimneys and fireplaces are unknown. The first wall is set back, allowing the upper floor and side walls to extend over the lower flooring, making it a portico built in instead of on the house. Light window frames, with their minute openings covered with fine rice paper instead of glass, are the doors and windows in one. They do not swing open and shut as do our doors, nor do they move up and down like our windows but slide like rolling doors. They form the partitions of the houses inside and can be removed at any time, throwing the floor into one room. They have two very pretty customs in Japan. The one is decorating their houses in honor of the new year, and the other celebrating the blossoming of the cherry trees. Bamboo saplings covered with light airy foliage and pinioned so as to incline towards the middle of the street where meeting they form an arch make very effective decorations. Rice trimmings mixed with seaweed, orange, lobster, and ferns are hung over every door to ensure a plentiful year, while as sentinels on either side are large tubs in which are three thick bamboo stalks with small evergreen trees for background. In the cool of the evening, we went to a house that had been specially engaged to see the dancing, or geisha, girls. At the door we saw all the wooden shoes of the household, and we were asked to take off our shoes before entering, a proceeding rather disliked by some of the party, who refused absolutely to do as requested. We effected a compromise, however, by putting cloth slippers over our shoes. The second floor had been converted into one room, with nothing in it except the matting covering the floor and a Japanese screen here and there. We sat upon the floor, for chairs there are none in Japan, but the exquisite matting is padded until it is as soft as velvet. It was laughable to see us trying to sit down, and yet more so to see us endeavor to find a posture of ease for our limbs. We were about as graceful as an elephant dancing. A smiling woman in a black kimono set several round and square charcoal boxes containing burning charcoal before us. These are the only Japanese stove. Afterwards, she brought a tray containing a number of long-stemmed pipes, Japanese women smoke constantly, a pot of tea, and several small cups. Impatiently, I awaited the geisha girls. In the tiny maidens glided at last, clad in exquisite trailing angel-sleeved kimonos, the girls bow gracefully, bending down until their heads touch their knees, then kneeling before us murmur gently a greeting which sounds like coin banwa, drawing their breath in with a long hissing suction, which is a token of great honor. 
The musician sat down on the floor and began an alarming dim upon the samisons, drums, and gongs, singing meanwhile through their pretty noses. If the noses were not so pretty, I am sure the music would be unbearable to one who has ever heard a chest note. The geisha girls stand posed, with open fan in hand above their heads, ready to begin the dance. They are very short with the slenderest of slender waists. Their soft and tender eyes are made blacker by painted lashes and brows. Their midnight hair, stiffened with a gummy wash, is most wonderfully dressed in large coils and ornamented with gold and silver flowers and gilt paper pompons. The younger the girl, the more gay is her hair. Their kimonos, of the most exquisite material, trail all about them, and are loosely held together at the waist with an obi sash. Their long flowing sleeves fall back, showing their dimpled arms and baby hands. Upon their tiny feet they wear cunning white linen socks cut with a place for the great toe. When they go out they wear wooden sandals. The Japanese are the only women I ever saw who could rouge and powder and be not repulsive, but the more charming because of it. They powder their faces and have a way of reddening their underlip just at the tip that gives them a most tempting look. The lips look like two luxurious cherries. The musicians begin a long chanting strain, and these bits of beauty begin the dance. With a grace, simply enchanting, they twirl their little fans, sway their dainty bodies in a hundred different poses, each one more intoxicating than the other, all the while looking so childish and shy, with an innocent smile lurking about their lips, dimpling their soft cheeks, and their black eyes twinkling with the pleasure of the dance. After the dance, the geisha girls made friends with me, examining with surprised delight my dress, my bracelets, my rings, my boots, to them the most wonderful and extraordinary things, my hair, my gloves, indeed they missed very little, and they approved of all. They said I was very sweet, and urged me to come again, and in honor of the custom of my land, the Japanese never kiss, they press their soft pouting lips to mine in parting. Japanese women know nothing whatever of bonnets, and may they never. On rainy days they tie white scarves over their wonderful hair dressing, but at other times they waddle bareheaded, with fan and umbrella, along the streets on their wooden clogs. They have absolutely no furniture. Their bed is a piece of matting, their pillows narrow blocks of wood, probably six inches in length, two wide and six high. They rest the back of the neck on the velvet-covered top, so their wonderful hair remains dressed for weeks at a time. Their tea and pipe always stand beside them, so they can partake of their comforts the last thing before sleep and the first thing after. A Japanese reporter from Tokyo came to interview me, his newspaper having translated and published the story of my visit to Jules Verne. Carefully he read the questions which he wished to ask me. They were written at intervals on long rolls of fool's cap, the space to be filled in as I answered. I thought it ridiculous until I returned and became an interviewee. Then I concluded it would be humane for us to adopt the Japanese system of interviewing. I went to Kamakura to see the great bronze god, the image of Buddha, familiarly called Dayabutsu. It stands in a verdant valley at the foot of two mountains. It was built in 1250 by Onogoro Yemen, a famous bronze caster, and is 50 feet in height. It is sitting Japanese style, 98 feet being its waist circumference. The face is 8 feet long, the eye is 4 feet, the ear 6 feet 6 and 1 half inches, the nose 3 feet 8 and 1 half inches, the mouth is 3 feet 2 and 1 half inches, the diameter of the lap is 36 feet and the circumference of the thumb is over three feet. I had my photograph taken sitting on its thumb with two friends, one of whom offered fifty thousand dollars for the god. Years ago, at the Feast of the God, sacrifices were made to Diabutsu. Quite frequently the hollow interior would be heated to a white heat, and hundreds of victims were cast into the seething furnace in honor of the god. It is different now, sacrifices being not the custom, and the hollow interior is harmlessly fitted up with tiny altars and a ladder stairway by which visitors can climb up into Diabutsu's eye and from that height view the surrounding lovely country. We also visited a very pretty temple nearby, saw a famous fan tree and lotus pond, and spent some time at the most delightful tea house, 
where two little Jap girls served us with tea and sweets. I also spent one day at Tokyo, where I saw the Mikado's Japanese and European castles, which are enclosed by a fifty-foot stone wall and three wide moats. The people in Tokyo are trying to ape the style of the Europeans. I saw several men in native costume riding bicycles. Their roads are superb. There is a street car line in Tokyo, a novelty in the East, and carriages of all descriptions. The European clothing sent to Japan is at least ready-made, if not second-hand. One woman I saw was considered very stylish. The bodice of a European dress she wore had been cut to fit a slender, tapering waist. The Japanese never saw a corset, and their waists are enormous. The woman was able to fasten one button at the neck, and from that point the bodice was permitted to spread. She was considered very swell. At dinner one night I saw a Jap woman in a low-cut evening dress with nothing but white socks on her feet. It would fill a large book if I attempted to describe all I saw during my stay in Japan. Going to the great Sheba temple, I saw a forest of superb trees. At the carved gate leading to the temple were hundreds of stone and bronze lanterns, which alone were worth a fortune. On one side of the gate were gigantic carved images of ferocious aspect. They were covered with wads of chewed paper. When I remarked that the school children must have made very free with the images, a gentleman explained that the Japanese believed if they chewed paper and threw it at these gods and it stuck, their prayers would be answered. If not, their prayers would pass unheeded. A great many prayers must have been answered. At another gate I saw the most disreputable-looking god. It had no nose. The Japanese believe if they have a pain or ache, and they rub their hands over the face of that god, and then where the pain is located, they will straight away be cured. I can't say whether it cured them or not, but I know they rubbed away the nose of the god. The Japanese are very progressive people. They cling to their religion and their modes of life, which in many ways are superior to ours but they readily adopt any trade or habit that is an improvement upon their own. Finding the European male attire more serviceable than their native dress for some trades, they promptly adopted it. The women tested the European dress, and finding it barbarously uncomfortable and inartistic, went back to their exquisite kimonos, retaining the use of European underwear, which they found more healthful and comfortable than the utter absence of it to which they had been accustomed. The best proof of the comfort of kimonos lies in the fact that the European residents have adopted them entirely for indoor wear. Only their long subjection to fashion prevents their wearing them in public. Japanese patriotism should serve as a model for us careless Americans. No foreigner can go to Japan and monopolize a trade. It is true that a little while ago they were totally ignorant of modern conveniences, they knew nothing of railroads, or streetcars, or engines, or electric lighting. They were too clever, though, to waste their wits in efforts to rediscover inventions known to other nations, but they had to have them. Straight away, they sent to other countries for men who understood the secret of such things, and at fabulous prices and under contracts of three, five, and occasionally ten years' duration, brought them to their land. They were set to work, the work they had been hired to do, and with them toiled steadily and watchfully the cleverest of Japanese. When the contract is up, it is no longer necessary to fill the coffers of a foreigner. The employee was released, and their own man, fully qualified for the work, stepped into the position. And so in this way they command all business in their country. Kimonos are made in three parts, each part an inch or so longer than the other. I saw a kimono a Japanese woman bought for the holidays, it was a suit, gray silk crepe, with pink peach blossoms dotting it here and there. The whole was lined with the softest pink silk, and the hem, which trails, was thickly padded with a delicate perfume sachet. The underclothing was of the flimsiest white silk. The whole thing cost sixty dollars, a dollar and a half of which paid for the making. Japanese clothing is sewed with what we call a basting stitch, but it is as durable as it could be if sewed with the smallest of stitches. Japanese women have mirrors in which they view their numerous charms. Their mirrors are round, highly polished steel plates, and they know nothing whatever of glass mirrors. All the women carry silk card cases in their long sleeves, 
in which are their own diminutive cards. English is taught in the Japan schools, and so is gracefulness. The girls are taught graceful movements, how to receive, entertain, and part with visitors, how to serve tea and sweets gracefully, and the proper and graceful way to use chopsticks. It is a pretty sight to see a lovely woman use chopsticks. At a tea house or at an ordinary dinner, a long paper laid at one's place contains a pair of chopsticks, probably 12 inches in length, but no thicker than the thinner size of lead pencils. The sticks are usually whittled in one piece and split only half apart to prove that they have never been used. Everyone breaks the sticks apart before eating, and after the meal they are destroyed. An American resident of Japan told me of his going to see a cremation. The Japanese graveyard is a strange affair, with the headstones set close together, leaving the space for the graves less than the size of a baby's grave in America. As soon as the breath has left a body, it is undressed and doubled up head to feet, and is made to go in a very small bamboo box built in imitation of a Japanese house. This house may cost a great deal of money. It is carried along the streets on two poles to the place where it is to be cremated, where it is given in charge of the cremator, and the friends go back to their homes until the following day when they return for the ashes, which are generally placed in an urn and buried. The American, of whom I spoke, made arrangements with the cremator, and accompanied by a friend, walked to the place in the country and waited out of sight until the mourners had vanished, before they dared to draw near enough to see the cremation. They had walked quite a distance dinnerless, and said naively that the odor was like that of veal, and it made him ravenously hungry. A small hole about three feet long is made in the earth, and in it the fire is built. When it was the proper heat, the box was set over it, and in an instant it was consumed. The body released from its doubled position straightened out. The lower half being over the fire was soon cremated, excepting the feet and knee joints. The man in charge carefully pulled the upper part of the body over the fire, and with the same large fork put the half-consumed feet and knee joints under the arms. In less than an hour all that remained of the body was a few ashes in the bottom of the pit. While the cremator was explaining it all to the gentleman, he repeatedly filled his little pipe and lit it with the fire from the burning body. At his urgent request the gentleman consented to take tea with him when his task was done. They entered his neat little home, where he jumped into a boiling bath in the open garden, from which he emerged later as red as a lobster. Meanwhile his charming and pretty daughters were dispensing the hospitalities of their home to their guests, and the father, desirous of enjoying their society, came in and stood in the doorway, talking to them and watching them eat while he wiped his naked body with a towel. The prettiest sight in Japan, I think, is the native streets in the afternoons. Men, women, and children turn out to play shuttlecock and fly kites. Can you imagine what an enchanting sight it is to see pretty women with cherry lips, bright black eyes, ornamented glistening hair, exquisitely graceful gowns, tidy white stocking feet thrust into wooden sandals, dimpled cheeks, dimpled arms, dimpled baby hands, lovely, innocent, artless, happy, playing shuttlecock in the streets of Yokohama? Japanese children are unlike any other children I ever saw at play. They always look happy and never seem to quarrel or cry. Little Japanese girls, elevated on wooden sandals and with babies almost as large as themselves tied on their backs, play shuttlecock with abandon that is terrifying until one grows confident of the fact that they move with as much agility as they could if their little backs were free from nursemaid burdens. Japanese babies are such comical little fellows. They wear such wonderfully padded clothing that they are as shapeless as a feather pillow. Others may think, as I did, that the funny little shaven spots on their heads was a queer style of ornamentation, but it is not. I am assured the spots are shaven to keep their baby heads cool. The Japanese are not only pretty and artistic, but most obliging. A friend of mine who guided us in Japan had a Kodak, and whenever we came upon an interesting group he was always taking snapshots. No one objected, and especially were the children pleasant about being photographed. When he placed them in position, or asked them to stand as they were, they would pose like little drum majors until he gave them permission to move. The only regret of my trip, and one I can never cease to deplore, was that in my hasty departure I forgot to take a Kodak. On every ship and at every port I met others, and envied them, with Kodaks. 
they could photograph everything that pleased them. The light in those lands is excellent, and many were the pleasant mementos of their acquaintances and themselves they carried home on their plates. I met a German who was spending two years going around the world, and he carried two Kodaks, a large and a small size, and his collection of photographs was the most interesting I ever saw at the different ports he had professional photographers develop his plates. The Japanese thoughtfully reserve a trade for their blind. They are all taught massage bathing, and none but the blind are allowed to follow this calling. These people go through the streets uttering to a plaintive melody these words, I'll give you a bath from head to toe for two cents. At Ueno Park, where they point out a tree planted by General Grant when on his tour around the world, I saw a most amusing monkey which belonged to the very interesting menagerie. It was very large and had a scarlet face and gray fur. It was chained to the fence, and when one of the young men in our party went up and talked to him, the monkey looked very sagacious and wise. In the little crowd that gathered around, quite out of the monkey's reach, was a young Jap who, in a spirit of mischief, tossed a pebble at the red-faced mystery, who turned with a grieved and inquiring air to my friend. "'Go for him!' My friend responded sympathetically to the look, and the monkey turned and with its utmost strength endeavored to free itself so it could obey to do the bidding. The Jap made his escape, and the monkey quieted down, looking expressively at the place where the Jap had stood, and then at my friend for approval, which he obtained. The keeper gave the monkey its dinner, which consisted of two large boiled sweet potatoes. My friend broke one in two, and the monkey greedily ate the inside, placing the remainder with the other potato on the fence between his feet. Suddenly he looked up, and quick as a flash he flung with his entire force, which was something terrific, the remaining potato at the head of someone in the crowd. There was some loud screaming and a scattering, but the potato missing all heads went crashing with such force against a board fence that every particle of it remained sticking there in one shapeless splotch. The chap who had tossed the pebble at the monkey and so earned his enmity quietly shrunk away with a whitened face. He had returned unnoticed by all except the monkey, who tried to revenge himself with the potato. I admired the monkey's cleverness so much that I would have tried to buy him if I had not already owned one. In Yokohama, I went to Hundred Steps, at the top of which lives a Japanese bell, Oyushisan, who is the theme for artist and poet, and the admiration of tourists. One of the pleasant events of my stay was the luncheon given for me on the Omaha, the American war vessel lying at Yokohama. I took several drives, enjoying the novelty of having a Japanese running by the horses' heads all the while. I ate rice and eel. I visited the curio shops, one of which is built in imitation of a Japanese house, and was charmed with the exquisite art I saw there. In short, I found nothing but what delighted the finer senses while in Japan. End of chapter 15